uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'll, we'll keep it, I'll keep it nice and short from my side because we do want to really dig into Vivek's uh, extreme knowledge around these topics. But just to give you a rundown of what we're going to be talking about today, it's coming out of COP26. Obviously, there was a number of uh, very large announcements being made, but one of the most important ones that we've been thinking about is the relationship and of uh, the transition from coal into new energy sources, uh, and particularly Australia and Japan's relationships to that uh, those announcements and how that might shape our future. So we'll have a, a bit of a, a talk about what came out of COP26. We'll then move into a discussion around particularly the hydrogen markets that are moving forward and how that will impact both, uh, both our countries um, at a sort of government level as well as a business level. And then finally, we'll have a think about um, how this uh, will impact businesses and uh, even down to the individual level. So Vivek, if we can start, <clears throat> um, it's interesting that uh, when we came to, uh, you know, we had COP26 uh, well, almost a month and a half ago now, uh, and one of the big announcements out of that was the global, clean, uh, global coal to clean power transition statement. Uh, and it's interesting, there was four main points that came out of that. And if you just uh, allow me to read the first two, because I think we can focus on those first. Uh, the uh, point one was to rapidly scale up our deployment of clean uh, uh, power generation and uh, energy efficiency measures in our economies and support other countries to do the same. And the second was to rapidly scale up technologies and policies in this decade to achieve the transition from unabated coal generation in the 2030s for major economies and 2040s in uh, developing uh, economies based around the Paris Agreement. Now, the interesting thing is that neither Australia or Japan came out in support of those uh, particular uh, mm -hmm. points. So if I can ask you now, if you can give us a big picture on where you think those ideas came from uh, and potentially the relationship that Australia and Japan have with those global agreements and how we might move forward on that. Sure. So if I can start by, by just saying like how critical, I guess, the, the power sector is when we talk about decarbonization. It is um, already the one pathway which is already showing incredible promise in terms of being economic. And, and that's with the, re the, the renewable energy deployment. And I think when it comes to how much will renewable energy be deployed, I think the question for both um, you know, Japan and Australia is that it's gonna happen at, a, at, at quite a pace. The question is, is that pace enough? And, and I think that's, you know, to talk to that first point that you mentioned, supporting the rapid deployment of renewable power, I think that is comfortably something that is in line with what both countries want, both governments want, and even down to the corporate sector. I think where there is more hesitation is, is the speed adequate? You know, and I think that's where there is a lot more um, conjecture and, and conversation, but the power sector is absolutely essential if we're going to talk about deeper decarbonization in other sectors. So it's a real enabler. So if we can't get the power sector decarbonized, it's going to be very challenging to decarbonize other sectors. And so this is why this deployment is, is going to happen, but the speed at it, which it is, is going to be the one which is going to have the most questions. So if we can focus on the speed. So, you know, th th there was a lot of fanfare around this and obviously we had the 2030 goals and there's a lot of talk about, you know, decarbonizing by 2030 and reducing emissions by 50% around the world all these things, but there was some resistance from not only Australia and Japan, but you know, other countries around the world. What sort of time scale do you think the, our, our, our countries are looking at to make it a realistic transition that is gonna be real and impactful? Sure. So coming down to what was actually agreed by say Australia and, and Japan, if we look at Australia, you know, trying to find a like for like comparison, they're basically looking for a 26% reduction from of their CO2 emissions uh, from 2010 to 2030, right? Comparatively, Japan is more ambitious. They're looking for about 38% reduction. Now, both of those targets are only two degree compliant, right? So looking at it from that perspective, is it technically in line with the Paris Agreement? Yes, it is. But really where the world is shifting towards is can we achieve 1.5 degrees? And so far, those ambitions haven't been there in terms of, of, of that change. In terms of how that power sector is really going to change, I think there's enormous amount of work that needs to be done this decade to really feel like we're, we're moving in that direction. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of planning. Um, if I take Australia, for example, you know, we just released um, our integrated system plan from our um, energy uh, um, uh, operator here in, 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 uh, in Australia. And what came out of that was 
basically the step change scenario, which was there as a as purely as a as, as a blue sky scenario just two years ago, that now is the central scenario, right? Because we're seeing such a big movement in that direction in terms of the rapid deployment. Now, this is incredible. We we need to see three times the renewable generation um, deployed this decade. But going out to 2050, we're talking nine times the deployment of renewable energy, right? And so this is now factoring into base case. And what else do we need to have in order for this to happen? We need to see coal exit quicker. We need to see uh, storage come in. We need to see transmission assets come up. And I think these are the stories that we have to see unfold in both Japan and Australia, obviously to different extents, given that they're different power markets and exactly how renewable energy works in both countries are different but we need to see this rapid change happen over the next few years to feel confident that these 2030 um, and 2050 targets are really something that's achievable. So if I'm understanding that correctly, it's almost like there's a, a natural, um, sp the speed is in the, the private sector or, or the utility sector is actually ahead of where the governments are setting the targets and where, where, where the government's setting the boundaries. Is that right? Look, for, for Australia, I'd say that uh, th there is certainly that trend where I think corporates um, and even state governments have been far more ambitious about what they can actually reduce than what um, I, I guess the federal government is, is stating. I think with Japan, they have come out with a very ambitious target. That 38% reduction was agreed to this year just prior to, which, which was actually um, formalized from the 2013 level, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was, I think about 46% and, and that was announced this year. So Japan, as a government actually became very ambitious about it. The question is, are, are we going to see that really happen when we look at the, the power sector? And, you know, there are promising steps, you know, like the push towards offshore wind. You know, there is that look for, say, 10 gigawatts this decade. Um, and and that's, that's promising. But you're equally also favoring some technologies like, say, hydrogen, ammonia, carbon capture. Now, are these what are currently required for this transition to happen quickly this decade? Or is it better to put the levers into renewable generation expanding heavily? And, and I think those are the questions that have to be asked because I think in Japan, that's going to be more of the question. Um, and on top of that, you've also got issues with say transmission. You know, is transmission working alongside um, renewables so that we get the maximum scale possible? And I think those are the questions that need to really uh, be answered this decade. Um, and that's true of Japan and, and, and Australia, but I think at least Japan's a government target is 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 very ambitious. So, if we want to extend that, so COP twenty six obviously there was a lot of fanfare around it, and it was you know one of the five year um, COPs where they had, governments had to upgrade their their um, ambitions. There was a lot of talk about you know, bringing that time scale down to one or two years on those upgraded ambitions. Um, from your understanding of where the Australian government is and indeed the Japanese government is, are they still being aligned around those things or are they sort of going off in their own direction, um, sort of more relevant to their own markets and, and maybe stepping away a little bit from those global agreements and the importance of those? Sure. So look, that's like, it's not quite, I wouldn't say that's certainly set in stone. I think there's, there's, there's a lot of variability in terms of how exactly do we get to these decarbonization targets? You know, like you can set, say, 2050 targets um, and even make very ambitious things to 2030, but what's the roadmap to get there? Mm. And, and I think that's where the, the practicality of it is, is really where some are looking to be very cautious about it. And that's where you see the hesitation. And there are some who are um, being very ambitious about what, what they can achieve. But, you know, th there is still a lot of uncertainty about where technology will go in the next decade in order to get that, that reduction. Renewable energy certainly looks to be the, the key step forward. And, and I think maximizing that deployment is, is absolutely critical. And, and I think that's consistent with what Japan and, and, and Australia are doing. I, I would say that the, the, it's not a step away from the Paris Agreement or you know, trying to um, moderate that, that ambition. I think it's, it's very much a question of um, practically where are we and where can we get to? I think that is what has really held back and made it a lot more conservative than what it could potentially be. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, you were talking about transmission and, and so sort of supply chains around energy, that, that that's all going to change to, from what we've had in the past. And obviously, if we can sort of move into that, the hydrogen space, um, particularly around the relationship that Australia and Japan are developing around that and that the not putting all their eggs in that basket, but definitely there's a, there's a big focus on that hydrogen uh, supply and that relationship. 
before we get into that, first, I mean, there's a whole rainbow of potential hydrogen solutions these days. Um, but as we discussed before, we want to sort of focus on the blue, green and grey type of hydrogen. Just before we get into that conversation a little bit more, can you just give us a definition of what those are so people can understand where we are? Sure, sure. So uh, predominantly today, nearly all the hydrogen that's produced is what we call grey hydrogen. And that's effectively where you take your fossil fuels and you break down that hydrocarbon chain into hydrogen and uh, the byproduct is CO2, right? So it's a CO2 emitting process, right? Now, um, when we talk about blue hydrogen, the difference is that we capture that CO2. Now, the best technologies out there, we're talking about 90% capture rates, right? And that doesn't even include some of the upstream emissions associated with say gas production or coal production. So there is certainly uh, question marks about that. And it's seen very much as an imperfect solution. So we have definitely seen uh, some markets gravitate heavily away from, from uh, blue hydrogen and, and Europe is, is a good example. Um, and then you have your green hydrogen, which is effectively taking water, running a current through it and splitting that into hydrogen and oxygen. Now, if that power is sourced from renewable energy, you effectively get carbon-free hydrogen. And, and that is the one which is probably getting the most support um, and the most investment signals um, at the moment. Okay, so thank you very much, because I think a lot of people are getting confused around <laughs> what they what they all mean. So, you know, there's been a lot of announcements uh, very recently. I know Woodside are putting a lot of money into to, um, hydrogen investment up in Western Australia. Uh, Myra Benny's investing in, in some of the southern states down here from the Japan into Australia thing. Can you give us an overview, overview of what that relationship looks like between Australia and Japan, both at the governmental level and at the, the private sector level around hydrogen and how you see that moving forward? Sure. So look, the, the relationship, I, I guess I'll first start by saying that what Japan is trying to do on the hydrogen supply chain isn't just exclusive to Australia. You know, we have seen uh, Japan look to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Europe, um, you know, they have certain, and, and Southeast Asia, as potential um, avenues to build out that hydrogen supply chain. So it's certainly, you know, the way that, that Japan is approaching it, it's, it's one that they're very much looking at several opportunities. And Australia is certainly one of them that they're looking at quite closely. Now, saying that there are a number of investments that, that, that uh, Japan is looking to build with, with Australia, several projects. And you can see what they're trying to do based on uh, almost different experiments of, of, of hydrogen, right? So, you know, there's one blue hydrogen project, which is notable, and that's in Victoria and the Latrobe Valley. Um, now, they haven't done the carbon capture element of that as yet. And, from what we understand, there are technical issues there, but that comes from coal gasification. So using brown coal, getting your blue hydrogen and then liquefying that and transporting it back to Japan, right? So, you know, Kawasaki Heavy Industries and, and a number of, of Japanese corporates are involved there um, in terms of, of, of that project. But you, you look elsewhere in Tasmania um, and, and even Queensland, there are projects there where, you know, we are seeing green hydrogen be, be focused on. Um, and so looking at purely the renewable energy side. Um, and, you know, we're seeing variations in terms of transport. So not just, say, liquid hydrogen, we're looking at also ammonia as a form of transportation of hydrogen. So you can see that the way the, 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 the Japanese side is looking at, at Australia is let's test and flex um, different projects and, and feasibility studies to see where the economics stack and how, how um, technical or how proven is some of the tech that they have to build out. Now, sorry, please continue. If I have to say one thing is that the way of the mode of transport is going to be critical. You know, the, when, when you talk about, say, uh, liquid hydrogen, to just move it as liquid hydrogen, you're going to lose about a third of the energy contained in the hydrogen itself. So, you know, hydrogen is a very light gas and it takes enormous energy to liquefy, right? Now, when you talk about ammonia, it's, it's something which has garnered far more interest because you're only going to lose about a fifth of the energy in the reconversion process. But what makes ammonia even more attractive is that you can use ammonia standalone. So, you know, ammonia is certainly, you know, firming up to be the favorite when we talk about how hydrogen is transported. And so that's very much where the market is. And, and I think Japan will move towards that level of, of looking at ammonia in particular. So I want to come back to the ammonia thing, but you, you brought up an interesting point about different regions of Australia sort of transitioning across, and particularly the, the Latrobe Valley. You know, 
for over 100 years, a very big coal production area. So are they sort of basically uh, thinking about, okay, this is what we've already got. There's already a certain amount of infrastructure down there. So the blue hydrogen out of that type of uh, region in the country is a lower cost or, versus a completely new infrastructure set up with green hydrogen. How does that relationship look? <clears throat> sure. So look, something like like blue hydrogen out of um, the Toho Valley, like it certainly gives a way out of that sector once we see these coal power generators retire, right? When we talk about coal-fired power generation in Australia, it is still a significant chunk. I'm, I'm talking 66% of power generation last year was coal, right? And brown coal, which is predominantly out of, out of Victoria, which is the most polluting, you know, that's the one which is going to have to transition quickest if you really are talking about uh, a move towards decarbonization. And so are we going to have you know, uh, almost the next, um, you know, uh, what, what will these sectors look like after um, coal power um, retires? And, and I think this is where some of the thinking has gone is that actually, could it be ready for the new economy? Could it be ready for the decarbonized world? And I think that's where the idea has come from and whether it, it, it has merit financially for, for, for that to be the case. And, and I don't think it's just blue hydrogen. I think they're looking at, at multiple things. You, you know, you're going to see batteries, um, solar, wind, like a lot of these, you know, basins for coal power production have enormously useful um, power um, uh, transmission assets. So very high voltage around that area. So, you know, it, it is enormously beneficial to reuse those asset bases for something which is very power intensive. And so something like hydrogen or, um, you know, so some other high um, uh, power use is, is certainly something that is very attractive. And that's true of Latrobe Valley in Victoria, but also of, say, the Hunter Valley in, in, in um, New South Wales. So one question that many people have been asking me about this, you know, this, it's in the news, the hydrogen relationship between Australia and Japan is, if we are going to move to a green hydrogen future, um, which is obviously one of the goals, is why can't Japan produce that themselves here? Why do we have to ship it? across because obviously there's a whole bunch of emissions in the shipping process as well. I don't know if you can give us some insight around that. Sure. So look, this, this actually answers one of the key issues or differences between Japan's um, energy market, right? That when we talk about solar and wind resources, Japan doesn't sit on the most attractive relative to the world. So if you look at their, their green hydrogen costs, it will be more expensive than, than most um, of the main competitors in the world who are looking to produce green hydrogen, right? So first and foremost, that's, that's a key factor. Now, some of the reasons for that are well known, that if you're using onshore wind and, and solar, the costs associated, particularly with say land use and development is prohibitively high, right? Now, if you use offshore wind, that is also going to be quite expensive, particularly once you start looking at, at floating offshore wind, once you use up a lot of your um, bottom fixed connections. Right. So, you know, the cost involved can be quite high and can be quite significant. And so this is why the idea is, could we look at this from an efficiency perspective that we produce it elsewhere and then we import it um, and can that be a lower cost? Now, what we're seeing in some of the data and some of the analysis and projections is that for ammonia, it is efficient to do something like that. But if you then want to reconvert that ammonia back to hydrogen, it's almost better for then Japan to produce the hydrogen themselves. So, you know, th there is certainly that argument that's unfolding, but, you know, when it comes to Japan, the renewable penetration is more challenging, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, I think, you know, McKinsey put a report out that they're talking 60% in, in their base case scenario. Um, and that means there's a lot more work for um, other um, decarbonized sources to do. Um, and when I say renewable, I'm talking, you know, wind and, and, and solar, but then you have other assets like nuclear, um, you know, uh, hydro batteries, they, you, they have to do a lot more work when you talk about Japan's total decarbonized grid relative to say Australia, which could hit 80% renewables by 2030. So, you know, with, with Japan, it, it's a different story, but overall it's, it's a story on costs and, and, and just the wind and solar resources aren't, aren't rated as high. Well, that raises an interesting question when you say that, that Australia will be focusing on renewables potentially more than, than green hydrogen. So Australia is looking at green hydrogen as an A or ammonia or blue hydrogen, however that ends up looking as almost a purely export market. Is that right? And, and they, they won't be looking to those sort of solutions for, for homegrown power generation. Am I understanding that correctly? 
So look, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. And, and I think the way that this has, has been looked at has morphed in, in this year alone, right? Our, our view on this is that you probably need a domestic market to be built mm. um, first. Um, and that will really take in that, that, you know, five to 10 megawatt kind of scale for electrolyzers. But when you talk about um, exports, you're really talking about just moving it to a different scale. We're talking gigawatt capacity of electrolyzers in order to make an, an export um, project uh, bankable and, and workable. So, you know, when we talk about domestic use, it naturally fits into that upscaling. Right. Oh. And so there are certain applications which make sense already. So say trucking, if you put trucking along the East Coast, you know, trucking is, is one use where it, it, hydrogen fuel cells make more sense than battery electric vehicles because of just the weight and the mm. distance and the time you lose for refueling. So, you know, on, on those metrics, you know, long distance, heavy haul trucking makes perfect sense. So, you know, if we can build some of those sectors out, um, that certainly means that we can build that domestic hydrogen economy first before we step out into um, thinking about um, exporting. Okay, so there's so many questions we could be asking around this topic, isn't there? But it's, I want to go back to the point that you said there that you know, Japan's also exploring other options around the world, say the Middle East or, or different areas. Is Australia at a, almost like a competitive advantage, you know, just even geographically? Uh, and, and how does the political relationships and all those type of things factor into the Australia relation versus other competitors in the market? Sure. So look, it, 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 it doesn't sit with a, a standalone competitive advantage. You know, certainly like say Chile looks quite attractive. Um, the, the Middle East um, certainly has opportunities there. So, you know, I wouldn't say that you're guaranteed the lowest cost from, from Australia. I think we're, we're talking uh, bottom 10 costs, you know, Australia fits into that bucket, but there are certainly others there that, that, that can make it at, at low cost and deliver it to, to, um, Japan. The one thing going for Australia, though, is that we have a really strong historic relationship with, with Japan. You know, you're, you're talking steel industry, you're talking coking coal, you're talking iron ore, um, you know, uh, you're talking LNG. You know, Japan is one of our biggest trade partners. So, you know, it, it is certainly something that I think um, Australia and Japan can connect on. And I think that's why there has been so much interest in, in, in Australia, because it's reliable. Um, and that relationship is something that that is being long lasting. So let's take it another step down then. So we've been talking very much at the macro, sort of the the you know the big government level with COP twenty six. We're going into sort of industry level stuff or um, between the two countries. I suppose a question of of real value is how should um, business leaders, say particularly in Japan, think about this relationship and how it's developing, and what should they be looking for? In announcements and what's coming for you know, in the future and how might they want to think about how that will impact their businesses sure so i guess the first thing to decipher is how real is this i guess hydrogen right mm -hmm. story because right now we we have this idea that oh is this going to be the next big thing and the forecasts out there certainly have very um varied assumptions and and conclusions you know from from one side we have you know two percent of final energy demand by 2050 will be hydrogen to some studies which are saying 20 to 25 percent right so you know when you have a lot of these varied forecasts it really puts into perspective that there's a lot of unknowns in this right and so in terms of where the demand sectors are i'd say that corporates should should apply that kind of thinking about okay where is the competitive advantage where is the niche when it comes to that hydrogen application so you know transport you know like transport's a good one because in japan that is certainly one space where we've seen, um, you know, a lot of interest in terms of building out that that domestic hydrogen fuel vehicles and, and cars, and and particularly in the light vehicle space. Now, um, you know, Nissan were one of the first adopters into EVs. Um, Honda has moved into EVs, and just this last week, we have certainly seen a shift from Toyota, um, mm -hmm. which were originally targeting targeting 2030, um, somewhere in that that two million. Uh, cars, uh, EV cars, I think. And then now they've said three and a half million by 2030. So, you know, Toyota has shifted the, the dial as well towards EVs. And, and for us, that makes perfect sense that, you know, when you talk about the economics of, of round trip efficiency, battery electric vehicles are about 70 to 90% efficient. When you talk about fuel cell, um, uh, fuel cells, we're talking round trip efficiency of about 25 to 35. 
So, you know, there is an enormous gap there. And so uh, electric vehicles were always really going to win that race um, when it comes to um, uh, how we decarbonize certain sectors. And I think th this is where it's really important is that the biggest threat to hydrogen really evolving is how does electrification happen? Because electrification will, will be the lowest cost um, no matter which industry you're in. And for sectors that can't electrify it, this is where you have you know, molecule fuel like hydrogen or, or ammonia becoming mainstay. So those are really where the opportunities lie when we talk about, say, Australia, Japan, talking about, about hydrogen is what can't electrify. And mm. that is where the opportunity lies. So you know, when it comes to transport, you know, heavy trucking for us is certainly an opportunity. Remote power is an opportunity, but not so much for Japan, but industry. This is really where we're going to see a lot more interest. And this is why we've seen so much investment from heavy industry in, um, in hydrogen, because, you know, for low temperature um, and, and uh, heat, um, it makes sense to use heat pumps and um, um, electrification works. But when you're talking about high temperature heat, you're gonna need a, a, a carbon free molecule at some stage. And, and that is something where, where hydrogen works, right? As a feedstock. So in steel, hydrogen can, can really be the reductant. And, and that's something that we're seeing. So the steel industry is investing significantly into the potential for hydrogen to, to, to decarbonize. So, you know, we're certainly seeing um, this relationship develop, but I wouldn't go into it thinking everything will use hydrogen. Where electrification doesn't make sense, that is where hydrogen will likely flourish, right? And, and that's the way to think about it. It's fascinating because it's often the, the whole argument is, and it is an argument often between electrification and fuel cell technology, and it's sort of almost the VHS Betamax sort of mm -hmm. it's set up that way. But what you're suggesting is that that's not the case. So if we're looking at, um, if I'm getting this right from what you're saying, is that you, you really almost at the, the personal, individual, small scale um, part of the economy is going to be focusing on electrification potentially, whereas the the, the big, you know, the large, broad scale, um, heavy trucking, that type of stuff is going to be hydrogen. And that's sort of how it will probably shape out. Is that right? So I suppose one of the questions that might be coming up is that what might be some of the black swans, tough question, that, that, will come mm -hmm. up, that, will, that might impact those longer term decisions for um, industry leaders to think be thinking about what might come up that, to, that might shift it one way or the other? Sure. So look, when it comes to um, um, electrification, particularly in, in, in Japan, I'd say one black swan is what happens with nuclear, mm. right? You know, nuclear is, is a very efficient process once it's built, right? And, you know, it's something that can certainly decarbonize economy. Um, and, and for Japan, that's certainly something that, that it, can, it, it can certainly work. But in, in terms of, um, you know, how, how does that work in, that really does potentially lower the cost of electrification. Now, this is all about relative costs, right? And so if we can manage to reduce the cost of electrification, then it really becomes a story for, okay, um, the, the role of, of potentially a carbon-free molecule like hydrogen will, will be less, right? So, you know, wh where does, um, where does uh, uh, nuclear power go is, is one key question I'd say is, is, is still out there. The other is energy security, right? That you know, when we look at the 2030 plan for where China's, where, where Japan's power mix is going, what we see is, is you know, you're almost putting your eggs in, in equal baskets for gas, for coal, um, and even um, nuclear, right? And even though there's a, a big expansion of, say, renewables, you know, what we're talking about from, from the, the, the well-diversified mix is that certainly front of mind is we don't want to be putting our eggs in one basket, right? But putting like renewables and, and nuclear certainly like boosts that self-sufficiency. And from the modeling that I've seen, that can certainly reduce the cost of the transition if we see that deployment happen rapidly. But you know, the, 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 the amount of change that needs to happen for all that to occur is, is significant. But certainly um, that mindset that, okay, uh, coal and gas can be replaced and we don't have to kind of diversify and think about energy security, I think that's something that if it can shift, that could see rapid electrification of, of uh, renewable electrification of, of Japan. That's really interesting because there, there are those, yeah, it just sort of goes in that place. But I'm, I'm wondering also around 
Um, from a private sector, a, a lot of companies now are looking about, you know, scope one, two, and threes and all that type of stuff and they're putting into it. And we see some of the big, particularly American companies like Amazon and, and those guys saying, when they have their data centers, we have to have renewable energy as part of their, the, the energy mix transition to full renewables over time. I'm wondering how potentially, you know, things like that might impact the decisions being made around this moving forward. Yeah, look, in terms of the Japanese corporate space, like if we see the sign up to RE100, which is being renewable energy 100%, Japan was second to US in terms of the corporates that signed up. You know, so I think about 59 corporates. You know, so, so that's, that's significant. That's, you know, Japanese companies want to be uh, carbon free. They want to have 100% renewable energy. The question is, can that ambition be met with, you know, the, the level of, of change and the pace of change that's required? So I, I don't think there's a lack of appetite on the corporate side. It's just what will that look like and what will the cost be? And I think this is where you know, that, that cost side, we really need to be thinking about how do we incentivize this the best, the best way forward. And you know, something like, like a, a carbon price, you know, a fully functioning carbon price is certainly one avenue which could, could really see that change happen quickly. You know, like right now, the carbon price in, in Japan from the carbon taxes is, is, you know, it's, it has next to no impact. Um, you know, so if that really starts playing into it, it, it can have a big influence in terms of where does Japan go and what pathway does it do choose for decarbonization. And it's instead of government picking winners, it's, it's chosen by the market. Um, and, and that's certainly something that I think will give a lot more transparency to corporates in terms of where can we go and how should we do it? Because the full cost of something comes from a market-led kind of decision as opposed to a policy-driven decision, which in the next five to 10 years could change quite rapidly depending on the, the global mood. Yeah, and that's really interesting, that, that, that regulatory space that we, we have to think about here. So coming out of getting back to COP26, a lot of announcements made, a lot of targets and goals and all this type of stuff, but impl uh, implementation has often been the challenge um, for all of these things. We, we only have to see you know, how slow things have been moving around um, the, all the goals coming out of Paris you know, back in 2015. So maybe an unfair question, but from a regulatory space that you're seeing both in Australia and Japan, how do you think the, the, the speed of change and implementation from both um, regulatory environments might be impacting these, these sort of things? It's, it's a great question, right? Because on the whole, I'd say it's, it's probably too slow, yeah. right? And even though there is certainly a push to make it more efficient, you know, it still may not be enough to, to get the change required. Like if we take Japan, for instance, you know, if, if we see offshore wind, you know, there's a centralized auction scheme where they are looking at, at certain sites. So it is now the scheme that is picking the site, it's picking the, the grid transmission. It's, it's making sure that everything is available for that offshore wind project to proceed. Now that's a lot, that, that mechanism works a lot more efficiently than individual offshore wind projects trying to find a way through the, the regulatory environment, right? And, and that is certainly something which is a step in the right direction, but we need to see bigger steps like that for, for this industry to really decarbonize aggressively. In, in Australia, it's something where we're seeing something um, similar. You know, like we, 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 we had connection issues here where there was just inadequate transmission in certain parts of the grid. Um, to, to put out solar and, and, and wind generation. And it resulted in heavy curtailment and delays in connection. So there is now a process in place where that is streamlined and that people will know in advance exactly how that will work so that people know. It's all about transparency. And, and you know, that transparency and people knowing and that planning and, and knowing that there's, there's certainty in terms of a direction, I think that is what is absolutely critical right now when we talk about private a corp, uh, uh, um, uh, private entities being confident that an investment has, has long-term returns that they can look forward to. So uh, well, time is racing ahead. So I want to sort of bring it down to hopefully um, let you look into your crystal ball. Um, but often uh, in this space, particularly around sustainability and all of this area is that we hear a lot of stuff at that macro level, but a lot of people aren't being able to connect it to their own personal lives and potentially their roles within an organization. So if you can look into your crystal ball, um, how would we as individuals or even small businesses or that type of thing see the impact of these, um, you know, these transitions coming in the you know, next five, 10 years? Sure. 
Look, the, the, the one thing I'd, I'd certainly say is when it comes to the individual and you're looking at, say, reducing that carbon footprint and, and how exactly um, can that happen? Um, look, there's, there's a lot that is out of your control. You know, when we talk about that, that macro space and exactly where does your electricity come from? But what you see from a behavioral side is there's certainly a lot that can be done, right? And, you know, heating and cooling is one, one key component. Like, are, are we going to be comfortable with uh, a higher temperature when um, it's, it's very hot outside? Are we going to be comfortable with a lower temperature when it's cold outside? That can have quite an impact when we talk about um, CO2 emissions if that behavior is, is seen across the board. Um, so, you know, from, from behavioral aspect, that's very key. The other is also public transport, because that's something that can electrify very quickly. Um, and so from an individual and, and societal level, that's certainly something that can work, that if you have good functioning public transport like Japan has, you know, it, it really means that if, if that can be decarbonized, which, you know, say it's, it's linked to electricity, you, you get the gains immediately if, if people can shift towards um, uh, public transport over personal vehicle trains. Well, so that's interesting. So you, what we're talking before we were talking about card, you know, producers, you know, shifting and moving into these different spaces. Um, but what you're sort of talking about here is there's going to be a fundamental shift around the way cities and society are probably built. To be to, to be honest, again, tough question. Who's the winners and losers going to be in the long term? <laughs> these sort of things. It's look. It, 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 it is going to be tough to to, to pick that. Um, in terms of like, where does does the, the future look like in terms of a centralized workplace? Um, you know, that's also another question because post COVID, there are certainly been questions about hybrid working environments. You know, like e even here in Australia, you know, uh, that hybrid working environment of say working um, two days at home, three days at, 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 at work, um, you know, that certainly is something that, that could be here for, for, for the longer term. And, and that automatically means that, okay, we don't, do we need all the resources to go into the city? Um, are we going to have any suburban buildup um, in order to meet uh, these trends? You know, so are we going to see decentralization also take place when it comes to how people work? Um, and so, you know, these these factors, you know, it it, it certainly suggests that um, mobility, and particularly with the public transport, if that that overlay is there, is that personal mobility may not be as critical, right? Um, it, particularly if 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 we can make do with where we are with with decentralized structures. Right. The, the other, I, I guess, want to consider is, is circularity, right? And when we talk about recycling goods, right? Like often the way that models work right now is, you know, there is a producer that makes a good and a consumer that buys the good and owns it. But if, for instance, with, with a number of goods that we basically rent the good and then once it's over, it's the responsibility of the producer to, to recycle it, you really get to the, the, the crux of the problem where they will then design you know, a good which is easy to recycle, you know, and, you know, in batteries and, and so on to kind of recycle it cheaply and do it well, there is certainly incentives there to, to, to head in that direction. But this is something else which can certainly reduce your footprint if we start recycling quite considerably um, and think about, you know, goods as a rented good if the producer is responsible for recycling it at the end of the day. So that's an interesting point, and that's my own personal question around this. With the, the hydrogen infrastructure, can that become circular? And, you know, we, we talk about that with the electrification and the recycling batteries and so on and so forth. Can that be done in the, the hydrogen space? So, it, you know, it's, it, it's something which I'd say on the production side, it's certainly possible. So, you know, say storage, right? Can we use um, abandoned coal mines, underground coal mines for storage? And there's certainly a hope that that can be the case and that can really cut down on the costs. But a lot of that infrastructure is already there. Um, you know, like with pipelines, right? Like steel pipelines, um, they have issues because you can have embrittlement. But, you know, if we use plastic pipelines, um, say with PVC, you know, that certainly can mean that we can use some of those assets if, if that's possible. So that may mean that, look, should we have hydrogen production at distribution where, you know, we have plastic piping after that point, but not at the point of, of gas production traditionally because steel pipelines aren't as efficient to use or reuse in the case of um, you know, recycling um, old assets. But you know, th this is certainly a question which is being investigated by, you know, in, in, in Australia at least, by, by a number of the, the, the gas pipeline operators as they try and figure out how exactly to set their assets up for the next 15, 20, 30 years.
So does that mean that in the future we could actually see sort of like localized hydrogen energy production, you know, within cities, that type of stuff? So that we again back to the energy security and you know here in Japan with the natural um, earthquakes and all that type of stuff, is that something that might happen in the future of moving away from that model of centralized production? Yeah, look, with, with um, renewable energy, solar and wind, you already have that decentralized push, which is already more aggressive. When it comes to hydrogen and 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 um, what we're seeing there. There certainly has been uh, products which have already been released to the market. I think Lavo has been a household hydrogen slash battery uh, product, which is, you know, on, on a levelized cost of energy, still quite expensive. But certainly they're looking to target that retail market. And, you know, that, that can last for, for, for days. You know, like, like that's something that can certainly not be something that you're just talking shifting with a battery for a few hours. That's certainly something that can be useful. Um, well into the future as, as we try and, you know, displace loads from one day, one part of the day to another. Um, and so that's really where, um, you know, hydrogen and, and decentralized hydrogen can work. But overall, just the economies of scale really justify that that probably won't be how it works. You know, rooftop solar and, and batteries is probably the way to go. But decentralized hydrogen just right now, the economics just doesn't make sense from a retail scale. Brilliant. Okay, well, uh, we're racing up on time already. That, that's been brilliant. So if, if I could summarise, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong, is from that macro scale, you know, we had the global agreements, all these things are set in place. It's sort of given us a direction to focus on, but not everyone's 100% engaged in what came out of, of Glasgow necessarily, but it's definitely been a guiding light. And as we're moving down, that's particularly in the energy sources, we've got the, you know, all the different rainbow colours of hydrogen um, in in concert with electrification and potentially nuclear and other sources rather than in competition. Um, is that a fair way to do it? And I think ultimately that last section here is that it is going to impact every part of our life, isn't it? At, at some scale, whether we were engaged with it completely, but it's going to be very different. If we had this conversation in another five years, it potentially it could be a very, very different conversation. Would that be a fair summary of what we're, we're getting to? Yeah, look, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of change that's required and there's been a lot of talk. Yeah. I think the next five years is going to be about action. And we'll really see in the next five years whether the investment, the dollars, and the, 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 the scale of change that people are comfortable with, that's really going to be the challenge now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're all looking at it very intently, but it's, it's certainly a space that's transforming significantly. Um, and, you know, I think decarbonization is certainly here to stay. The question really is, um, what is the optimal low cost mix? And, you know, that is something that if you hit your bets too early, you may not get there. You may have higher costs, um, but equally, should you be supporting some sectors in order to make sure that we do make those strides relatively quickly, that's a government policy side, which is very tricky to pick and, and decide. So, you know, a lot of uncertainty, but, but certainly enormous potential in the next five years. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So personally, very fantastic. That, that really was most enlightening so i want to hand this over if there's anyone um that uh, would like to have a question please feel free to chuck it in the uh the q a i think you might have answered most people's questions vivid it was a very in-depth and concise thing. <laughs> but if anyone has uh, any questions in the chat or the uh no it looks like you might have uh, put it on answered everyone's questions so oh well here comes one all right chop the one in there when do you think uh, we will see hydrogen being used commercially to generate power? That one's come from MS. Again, crystal balling here, <laughs> Vivek. Yeah, sure. So look, in terms of, of how hydrogen is being thought of um, on the power side, this is, there's two ways to answer this, right? One is like it's, you know, some form of peaking power is going to be required in a system, whether you're in Australia or, or in Japan. In Japan, that that need will be higher because your renewable penetration is likely going to be lower. Um, but that um, hydrogen use will really be what is going to compete with your gas peaking, right? So your, your, your gas power generation, that's certainly the, the place where we're seeing a lot of competition with, with say hydrogen in the longer term. So already we're seeing turbines being generated which can fire out um, uh, hydrogen. Um, and, and, you know, th there are some risks with that, like when, when you fire, like when you use hydrogen as a fuel, you, you can have higher NOx emissions, which is, you know, considerably worse than CO2 emissions. So, you know, that has to be controlled for, but what it looks like is that's certainly something that can be controlled. So 
you know, that is something that, that can happen um, relatively soon. We're, we're talking 2030 plus, um, really speaking, when we talk about the costs being anywhere close to uh, being economic. Um, but, you know, when we talk about ammonia, you know, that is something which um, is going to be a potential replacement for the coal power generation in, in Japan. So already, you know, trials have been done for 20% coal firing of, of ammonia with coal. Um, and that has proven to be quite successful, right? And, you know, ultimately we're seeing projects looking to get to that 100% um, ammonia firing and, and using those assets. Now, coal is gonna be very important when we talk about base load. But it's going to be very expensive the more baseload ammonia you have in the long term. So, really speaking, you know that's something that that really has to be considered is is the cost element. And um, you know when when that becomes practical, we already know that um, Japan has got an import target by 2030 for 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 green ammonia. Um, and so that's you know ranging between three to five million tons. And and that's something that you know could expand as we hit 2040s. Um, but it's certainly something to, to, to watch carefully. But by 2030, both green ammonia and, and hydrogen um, could certainly be important in, in the power mix when we talk about Japan. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Okay, now we've got some questions coming in. Uh, how much longer do you think we'll see coal being used to generate base power in developing countries like India, et cetera? And that's actually an interesting one, how it expands out in those, particularly from, say, Japanese companies, how that affects their scope one, twos, and threes and those type of things. Yeah. So look, with 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 India, it, it is quite challenging, you know. To like, it's a developing economy, and you know, something that we need to see is if they are going to decarbonize. Like, look, the, the economics of it makes sense when we talk about um, solar and wind. You know, the the economies of scale of of production there makes makes that something that India should try and maximize as best as they can. But when it comes to um, pathways which are uneconomic, you know, this is where it becomes quite problematic to think about it from a perspective of, oh, we can cut coal immediately, right? Because for, for India, it has self-sufficiency when it comes to, to thermal coal. You know, it, it has a, a lot of coal that it produces itself. Now, if it's going to move away from that cheap coal that it can produce, you know, you certainly have risks now unfolding that they have to go through a higher cost pathway. Mm -hmm. And if that's not subsidized, you know, it certainly means that for them, it's like, why would they pay a higher cost given that they are a developing nation that is just moving down the, the development curve? So, you know, a developing nations face a lot more issues and they have to see the economics make sense if they're going to go down the pathway of, of hydrogen ammonia, which, you know, countries like Australia and Japan, you know, fortunately have high enough income where, you know, that, pay, that payment can be made. But for India, that decision is not easy because you're facing, you know, this decision between, um, you know, keeping poverty versus decarbonizing. And, and that's a very tough decision to, to lay on, on developing nations. And, and hence why even in COP26, there was open admission that they had disappointed in providing that financing for developing countries, that 100 billion a year that was promised. And, and that's an interesting point, too, because, I mean, particularly corporations that are operating globally, they do have to factor in these things and plan for these sort of transitions in other environments that, than where they miss, might necessarily, particularly around scope three emissions, you know, downstream and upstream things. And it's a tough one, I think. And I'm wondering if from your conversations with companies, are people looking that broadly and, that, and sort of factoring those type of things in, or is that still to come? Yeah, look, so far, the interest that we've seen is scope one and two. Yeah. I think scope three has certainly garnered some attention, you know, like miners are a good example where we've seen, you know, interest in say shipping and steel from say the iron ore miners, but it's, it's certainly something that, that, you know, where we're watching, you know, quite closely to see when will the penny drop and scope three becomes far more relevant. Um, but yeah, no, certainly if we had to look at it, I think the primary focus is what is in your control. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, scope three is is just you know um, a bridge too far at the moment, just given some companies and what they're facing. Mm, but I mean, obviously, the, the different power that that's going to come into those conversations further down the road. One last question from MS again: It's uh, is carbon capture a realistic way to manage emissions? As I assume there is always a potential for it to escape into the atmosphere. Well, there you go. You won't get too scientific about it, but maybe a quick one over that. <laughs> sure, sure. So look, with with, with carbon capture. It's, it's really going to depend on your source of, of what you're trying to, to capture it from, 
So if you're trying to get it from natural gas or you're trying to get it from, from um, hydrogen production or uh, say even ammonia production, you have uh, you know, a high rate of, of CO2 that is being directed in, in the flue gas itself. So that can be captured at relatively low cost. You know, so we're, we're talking 90% CO2 coming through a stream. But as soon as you dilute that, so you get to you know, uh, 50% or even say sub 20%, the economics become far worse, right? And so, you know, carbon capture in, in, from, from that kind of um, viewpoint, it, it really becomes tricky. So if you're talking carbon capture from say the power side, you know, that is quite expensive for both coal power and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, natural gas power generation. Because say, say we're looking at coal power because this is where interest has been, you know, the, the cost for say the next level of generation, and this includes for storage as well, we're talking 90 to to $120 US dollars per ton of CO2. You know, so it's 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 very expensive. But the next gen of technologies has really been talking that it could get as low as 60 to $65. So you know, it, there's a lot of promising development and, and carbon capture can play um, a certain role, but it's not going to be, I think, the game changer that people expect. Um, you know, and, and I think you're going to be constrained by, are you able to store it and exactly how, and you're going to need geological formations to do it, you know, and, and that is going to be a cost in itself, particularly if we're talking Japan. <laughs> and the earthquakes and everything else. One last question has come in from Sally, if I can just take up a last, last few minutes of your time. Here. So how can Australia's H2 production be competitive when we'll be effectively competing against cheap blue H2 and 3? Uh, ammonia coming out of countries like Saudi Arabia. That's a, that's an, well, I mean, we sort of danced around that a little bit before, but if you can dig into that, that's an interesting one. Yeah, sure. So look, it's it's going to be uh, coming down to what is the, um, like the cost of gas is going to be critical when we talk about um, H2, say blue H2 for, for Australia, right? And you're right that that if, if particularly Qatar, you can get very low cost of gas production, um, it's going to be very difficult to compete because you're, your, your cost of gas um, is going to be critical in terms of the economics. But green is probably where the economics will, will continue to improve more um, aggressively than what we're going to see in blue. In fact, green could be cheaper than blue by 2030. Right now, blue is currently cheaper than green, but by 2030, that, that those, those metrics can, can reverse. Now, it, really speaking, are we really going to look at the CO2 of this, right? Is that if we're really thinking about it from that perspective, you know, green um, H2 should be a premium at to, to blue because blue still has the CO2 emissions. So how exactly are we going to price that? Are we going to have certificates that indicate that something is carbon free versus a blue um, hydrogen product, which, which could certainly have CO2 still emitting and it will, it will sell at a discount because of that. So, you know, like the, these are factors that need to be considered, but certainly in the blue space, I'd say that's, that's right. But when you're looking at it from a, um, a green um, space, certainly the, the green side has, has a lot more going for it, um, particularly by 2030, if, if those costs come down as predicted. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That gets us into a whole different area with uh, certificates and carbon credits and all that other wonderful stuff that's going on. Um, so uh, Sally's just asking very quickly, because time is running, how are we going to <laughs> split it by green, blue? Uh, will that be Japan-led, do you think? Just a quick one, if we can. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Look, <laughs> look, that'll, like, look th that's a difficult one. I, I think it's in the process. I, I know at least here, um, Fortescue Future Industries is certainly pushing very hard to get certification of, of what is green and, and what is blue. So I think it's not just going to be from, from Japan side. I think it's going to be a story on the producer side because I think the producers are the ones who want to create that, that division more than the, the, the user. Because right now it's the producer that wants to separate and make sure that the green gets that premium. So I'd say it's actually more producer-led than, than demand-led. I'm likely to see a globally recognised one in any time soon. That's that's probably the problem. All right, Vivek, and uh, thank you so much. So that's been absolutely enlightening. It really, really has. And to everyone that's asked questions, it's brilliant, and people who've attended. Uh, Emily, are you there? Would you like to, to close out? Hi, um, thank you very much, Gavin, and thank you as well so much, um, Vivek, for both of your um, time and your expertise this afternoon. Um, gosh, we've covered so much content, but I really appreciate the way you approach the very real challenges uh, ahead, um, the areas of uncertainty that you touched on, approaching kind of future technologies, um, the societal changes that will address these challenges. But 
uh, really exciting to hear you discuss the many opportunities that exist for so many different sectors um, and especially in the context of our already very strong uh, trading partnership between Australia and Japan. So uh, big challenges ahead, but exciting times as well. So we're very fortunate to have experts such as yourself, yourselves um, as a part of the chamber to help us all make sense of these issues. So big thank you to you both again, and thank you very much to everyone who joined us. Uh, we'll release a recording of this session online afterwards. If you'd like to go back over any of the content or if you'd like to share it with anyone else in your network, uh, please do feel free to do so. Um, and we'll look forward to connecting with you all um, through this committee and other chamber events in 2022. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.